Hey, happy Sunday, everybody. I cannot wait to preach today because this is part two of last week. Um, it's the conclusion of last week, and you're going to know by the end of today that, yes, that had been a really long sermon last week. Um, if you weren't here last week, then I only have two options for you. You should probably fall on your face, repent before an almighty God that you skipped church. <laughs> or you can go back and watch it on YouTube this afternoon. Either way, it's there. And uh, I'd, I'd try the second one. Unless it was a sinful reason you missed church, then you may want to repent. But um, Acts chapter 28 is where we're going to be today. I was thinking about something yesterday as I was driving home. It's only five months till Christmas. Um, <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome for that. Uh, my daughter, Brinley, is a Halloween junkie. Um, she would actually, she'd skip all the other holidays for Halloween. That is her favorite. She already has her costume picked out. She has my costume picked out and every member of our family's costume picked out. I don't mean just our immediate family. She's picked out costumes for Uncle Dallas, Aunt Nicole, Cousin Trey, Cousin Hayden, Uncle Rob. <laughs> all of them. She has costumes for them. It's a whole theme for Brindley. She just embraces it. And I told her yesterday, I start, I, she was in the back seat of the truck and I said, Hey, Bryn, it's only three months till Halloween. And Jennifer was like, shh, shh. <laughs> she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I was just telling this. And I, then I realized what I was doing. If I would have reminded Bryn that it was only three months to Halloween, every day from now until Halloween, we would have heard about it. So uh, I'm excited for the end of the year. I, I believe the best is yet to come here at Real Life Church. Uh, we're still baptizing folks. We got more next week already scheduled. And God is, it's just, don't get over it, church. Don't miss it. Don't take it for granted what's happening. All right. So last week, let me recap a little bit so that you can kind of, uh, kind of be with us if you weren't here. Last week, we talked about in Acts chapter 27, Paul is a prisoner of the Roman government. And as a prisoner of the Roman government, he has this opportunity. Now, I'm going to say it's an opportunity, but it doesn't necessarily feel like an opportunity, probably, if you're Paul or you're watching Paul. So Paul has this opportunity to go before Caesar in Rome. I say, yeah, that sounds like an opportunity to either be killed or put back in prison. That, that's really the layout that we're looking at right now is Paul has left this dock. They're going to sail to Rome. He's going to be put in prison or they're going to cut his head off for preaching the gospel and being a dissenter. And so he, they start the journey. Paul says, it's not a good idea. We shouldn't go. The captain of the ship says, we're going. Everybody listens to the captain. They get out in the sea. The Bible says that a Northeastern comes in, storm hits, 14 days, they cannot see the sun and they cannot see the stars and the ship is getting beat to death. Finally, as we closed out the chapter last week, we know that the ship, they dropped all their anchors. They dropped everything. They dropped weight from the ship. The ship hit the reef and it says that the waves crushed the ship into pieces. And so all the men were grabbing anything they could to float to land. 276 men on board this ship, 276 men landed on shore. So I'm going to go back to a scripture. I don't normally title my messages. I, I, I was to clarify. I don't normally title my messages because that's just, I've just never done that. Um, so Dom, who does the slides for me on Sundays and helps with video stuff, um, he will ask me and I will say, what do you think? And so Dom titles a lot of the sermons that you see on YouTube when it has that little sermon thing on there or the title. That's not me. That's the team that does that. But today, if I were going to title my sermon, I would title it this. It would be when you know whose you are. When you know whose you are. Statement came to me a few years ago when my daughter went to college, my oldest daughter went to college, and she was going to a college that was known to be a liberal college, known nationwide, nationwide for um, a lot of things that probably coming from a Christian conservative home, a lot of people would question my parenting. Go, why would you let her go there? Why would you, why would you send her there? Well, two reasons. She was an adult. And more importantly than that one, I believed she knew who she was. And when you know whose you are, you don't get tripped up about who you are in certain situations. 
And so we sent her there and it ended up being fine and, and, and everything was good. She argued with the professors on what they thought about deity and she spoke it from a conservative background. She was very, very isolated um, in her environment, but she handled it well and she did good. But that statement, whose you are, when you know whose you are. I want to give you a scripture from chapter 27 uh, so that we can have a place to tie that thought to. And so chapter 27, verse 23, Paul is on the ship and it is not going well. And the men are freaking out. How many of you would be freaking out? The rest of you are liars. All of us are freaking out. If there were 14 days in the dark and the ship is being beat to death, we're all freaking out. By the part, this part, the ship is being held together by ropes. And Paul gets this vision from God, and this is what it says in verse 23. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong, to whom I belong, the God to whom I belong, whose I am, and who I worship. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. You're going to make it to Rome. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. All those who sail with you are going to make it. All 276, Paul. So this is a vision in the night from an angel that God gets this pro or Paul gets this promise from God. And so we flip the page and immediately the story never stops. It's one of the reasons I will challenge you when you're studying the Bible. You can use chapter and verse numbers for reference, but please ignore them while you're reading scripture. All right? Because sometimes the chapter and verse reference will break a, they will break a thought or a theme in scripture where it doesn't need to be broken in some Bibles. And so you see this here in chapter 27, this whole story, we're getting the shipwreck story, we're getting all this that happens. In verse 28, it says, and as they were brought through this storm. So it's the same story. There's no real reason for the break there. But it, we pick up right after where we left off last week. And it says this. And after we were brought safely through, we learned that we had landed on the island called Malta. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, I've been to Malta. No, no, no. I don't want you thinking right now. So I just want you to follow me here. Some of you are like, I've never been there. No, I want you to look at your neighbor and say, I've been to Malta. Okay. You're like, oh, you're gonna make me lie right here in church, Pastor Vince. I've never been to Malta. Just hang with me, all right? I've been to Malta. You've been to Malta. The word Malta means refuge is what it translates out as, which is interesting because as we get into this story, it is not, it is not gonna feel like a refuge. What I will tell you about this place is the Bible says it was an unfamiliar place. The Bible also tells us this is not the place They'd planned on ending up. How many of you in your life have ever been in an unfamiliar place that you didn't plan on ending up? Now say, I've been to Malta. Okay. Your Malta may look very different than Paul's. In fact, I pray it did. I hope it didn't come from 14 days of being beat to death on a ship only to land on a piece of wood on an island you didn't know or didn't recognize. But I will also tell you that there have been seasons in my life where the Malta that I landed on was a place I didn't expect because, you know, I'm the pastor and I'm supposed to give people counsel and I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to encourage people and other people get depressed and other people deal with anxiety. But right now I'm dealing with depression and I'm dealing with anxiety and this is a Malta I didn't see coming. Anybody been to Malta? Maybe your Malta isn't emotional. Maybe your Malta is a job that you thought, man, this is going to be the one. And then when you got in it, you realize it's everything but the one. And you're trying to, str you're struggling through and you're miserable every day and you don't know what to do there because this is not what I thought. Maybe you're, maybe you're the single lady and you've been praying for a ring and you can't find a number. Because this, Pastor Vince, I should be this. I should be married. I should have kids. I should have this. I should have that. And I don't have any of it. And it feels like Malta right now. But Vince, I had the plan. This is what it was supposed to look like. By the time I was 30, I was going to have 2.5 kids. And it's, I'm not there. And I feel like I'm shipwrecked over here on this plan. And it feels like Malta. 
I'm, it's unfamiliar and I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I feel like I just drug up on the beach. I don't have an answer. I don't have a direction. I don't know the language. I don't, I don't know the language. The Bible calls them barbarians. Maybe in your, in your Bible, it may say natives or islanders. The actual Greek word, Luke was a little more harsh when he was writing this. Luke called them barbarians. The only reason he called them barbarians is because he didn't understand their language. Like, I don't understand you, barbarian. No, <laughs> Luke was not a lot different than any of us, huh? I don't understand you. Well, you must be weird. So the, <laughs> Luke said they're barbarians. And so we see this. The first point I want to give you when you know whose you are, when you know whose you are, It doesn't matter where you are. Church, when you know whose you are, it doesn't matter where you are. Pastor Vince does my surroundings, my circumstances. Listen, I believe in all of it. Garbage in, garbage out. You put yourself in bad places, bad things are going to happen. I understand circumstances. But if you know whose you are in the midst of that season, you will walk right, you will walk proud, and you will walk in Christ as so long as. But we forget whose we are. The reason we struggle in circumstances isn't because God changed, it's because we forgot his seat in our life. And so we struggle. And so some of you now dealing in this place of Malta, this Malta season in your life where you don't know what, I don't know what else to do. So what do I do? I have a feeling that there was probably a moment where Paul gets on the island and finally wipes the seaweed out of his hair and looks around. And I'm sure he was deep... Whew. Okay, I made it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 274, 275. Has anybody seen Bill? 76. Okay, you did it. 270, you made it. You, what you said was true. All right, I'm, I don't know where we are, but your promise held. I don't know where we are, but your promise held. I don't, I don't, know, what, I don't know what we're supposed to do, but your promise held. Church, I want to encourage you with that today. You may not know where you are. You may be in a Malta season right now. Some of you may feel like you've lived in it. All your relationships are messed up. All the decisions you feel like you're making are messed up. All of the work, all of, all of it didn't end up like you planned. But he is faithful if you know whose you are. If you know whose you are, it doesn't matter where you are. Second thing that we see in this story, because I, I got to get to this part because I love this part. Second part of the story, we read, it says, after they were brought safely through, we learned that we landed on this place or the island was called Malta, this place of refuge. And, and so Paul realized it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter. And Paul, I'm going to tell you, it's insignificant. If you try to find it on the map, you got to look real close to get a real good map because Malta's tiny. And here's the writer of 16 books in the New Testament supposed to go to Rome to speak to the ruler of the free world. And he is supposed to be the one. He is supposed to, he's going to proclaim the gospel in the most powerful place on the planet. And he's shipwrecked on this little dot that nobody knows where it is. You may feel like that. That you have so much potential. That God has so much planned for you. But yet here I am sitting here on this island hanging out. I don't know what to do. Well, the enemy, the devil, likes such a good devil that he is. He does something for us. I'm going to give you this title or this point before I go into the point. When you know whose you are, it doesn't matter what they say. Did y'all catch that? When you know whose you are, it doesn't matter what they say. Because how many of you know they going to say a lot of stuff? And, and I love it because Luke writes it out just like I would write it out today if I was reading it and, and if I was writing it. Verse two says, the native people showed us unusual kindness. I love that, that they were actually expecting not kindness. It was unusual kindness. 
for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and it was cold. So it was cold out. It's raining. The storm that was out on seas now pushed to land and there's rain and it's cold and they're miserable and their boat's in pieces. And their food is all gone. They can't understand these people. Let's build them a fire. So they start building this fire. When Paul gathered a bundle of sticks. Paul being Paul, he's like, I'm not going to let you just serve me. I'll get up and serve. I'll go get some sticks. Paul goes and gathers some kindling for the fire, walks over to the fire, throws, starts to throw them on the fire. And since the fire had already started, there was heat built up. Heat was moving the snake or the viper that was in there. And the Bible says that the viper attached himself. Listen, I don't like snakes. I don't. Now, I'm not deathly afraid of them. If one came across the stage, then I would gladly throw your body on it um, <laughs> for the safety of everyone here. Um, but I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna freak out. But let's just. Can we just be honest with each other? If one attaches itself to me, this wasn't like. Wham! And you, no, it latched on, fastened himself. And I got a snake hanging off my hand. You're about to see a spiritual side of your pastor. <laughs> that you never, I don't speak in tongues, but I'd start right then. Okay? <laughs> Slain in the spirit, that's going to happen. I'm just going to, I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. Because this is big. There's a snake hanging off his hand. And Paul's trying to help. I imagine when this thing latched onto Paul's hand, Paul is at this point where he's just fine. Kind of, I, he's got to be like, are you kidding? He's, like, it's almost comical, right? It's almost like that. Nah, come on. So he's got the snake fastened on. Watch what they do. They. He, however, it says, Verse four, when the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand. I don't know why this is so funny for me. Some of you all don't have the imagination I do in reading the Bible. And for that, I am so, so sorry for you. Because this thing is vivid in my mind. Because actually you can look it up on the internet and go shipwreck in Malta. And it will show you the place where the ship landed. They have a big statue there with the Apostle Paul. Where it's historically recorded that this thing happened. They found anchors just off the reef where they dropped anchors. And they're there in the ocean. This, is ha this happened. This is real. And so I can see it, man. I, I looked at the picture of Malta. I'm like, I want to be shipwrecked there. Maybe not when Paul was, but now it's kind of nice. And so I see this and he's got, they look and this creature's hanging from his hand. And these people who were unusually kind in building the fire went from that to, he's a murderer. <laughs> he's a murderer. He's a mur They didn't stop there. No doubt. This man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice, now that word justice isn't, isn't like the word, it's the noun justice. It's a proper name. It's the name of a goddess of the sea. He's, he, got, he made it out of there, but justice found him. Has not allowed him to live. How many of you have seasons in your life, but there are those people that are around you that constantly remind you why this is happening to you. Well, if you just do this, if you'd have done it this way, or I'm not sure, I'm not sure you married the right person. That could be it. I'm not sure you, you I mean, did you pray about it when you took that job or did you just step into a mess? And they constantly have the the, the reason, though they don't know you. They have the reason why you're walking through this multi place, but they don't know you. They don't know your story. They don't know. Paul, a murderer? I'm watching Luke sit here in the sidelines with his little notepad on a boulder going, oh, they just called him a murderer. They tried to murder him like 15 times, tried to stone him. They shipwrecked. They beat him outside the city gates. No, they got it wrong. 
He's watching. And then verse five, as he gets to this part, he says, he, however, Paul, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. Can I ask a question that's non-spiritual? How many of you, when I read the phrase, shook off the snake, can't help but think of Taylor Swift? (laughs) Anybody with me? No? If it's you, just be honest. Okay, good. You're more spiritual than the 830 service. Now you're singing it. It's okay. Paul, he, however, he shook the snake off. Some of you are like, who's Taylor Swift? Who's Taylor Swift? So he shook. All right. I'm, I'm going to try to preach now. You got to shut it down. Okay. Don't sing the song. So as we, we get into this moment, we see Paul shake, shake the snake off and just keep going. And that's not, that's not what we do when they come speaking loudly. When they come with accusation. When they come with, with criticism. When they come. We don't, ah, I don't need that. No, we bow up. We want to fight. We want to say something back. We want to jump on social media and make sure they know exactly what we feel. Or we want to have righteous indignation and be able to blow up and blow and and have this moment where we get our words in and we have a right to say something back. And I'm I'm just gonna I'm gonna shut you down because you don't know better. Who of all people could have done that better than the Apostle Paul? I don't need this. And shook it off. Shook it off. And they were stunned. Listen, I'm gonna I promise you, this is always your best defense. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, shake it off. Don't sing it, just say it. (laughs) But see, here's the reality of it. It's our best event. You, I know, how many of you love real life church? Listen, would you believe that there are some people that don't? It's real. I've I've seen it. I I get the emails. I get get the, the social media comments. And, and they're, they're, people are creative with some of the things they've said about the church and about me and about our staff. And it's been incredible to watch. Boy, and when people find it, I get tickled because when they find something, they send it to me. Did you see this? <laughs> no, I hadn't. And would have been better off if I didn't. But thanks, I think. What do you want me to do? Nothing. No, no, no. They're not going to talk about my pastor like that. Like they don't get to, I'm not giving them that permission. They don't get to do that. They can't stop me. Not, not because of me, because of him. They can't, I I know who I, I know whose I am. And because I know whose I am, I know the circumstances and I know the words of them that don't know me don't matter. I know that. And so sometimes you and I have to be cautious. You say, Pastor Vince, I'm just tired of the church being bowled over. The church isn't being bowled over. The church just hasn't woke up and showed grace and showed mercy and showed restraint when it needs to show restraint. Instead, we get mad and we show anger. Guess who's great at anger? The enemy. So we look like fools. We look like fools because of what they said and what they said don't matter. I love that they said, that guy's a murderer and the ocean just missed him. So the snake got him now. And Paul went, (laughs) okay, we need more sticks. (laughs) Look what they do. Verse six, they were waiting for him to swell up and suddenly fall down. Do you know there are people watching and waiting for you to fail? Yep. They, they don't even know why. It would just bring them great joy for someone else to have a struggle in their life. Please, if this is you, I won't say this in jest. If this is you, you need to repent 
and fall down before a holy God and turn from that. Because we have enough struggle with the enemy. He doesn't need any help. They waited. Oh, hold on, hold on. Hold on, he's going to swell up. No, just chill, just have a, just sit down. It's going to happen. You notice not one, it doesn't say one place in here where they went and checked on him. It's not one place in here where one of them was like, oh, snake bite, let me get you some coconut oil or something and make that. No, no, I don't know if they had coconuts in Malta. I just, that was just random. <laughs> not one person went to help. They stood back and were like, just here to watch the car wreck. Just here to watch it. Didn't bother Paul. Didn't bother Paul. They waited for him to swell up and suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time, I don't know how long this was. I don't know how long they stood there like. It should be any minute now. Last week, that same snake bit somebody and they were dead in five minutes. Paul just walking around grabbing sticks. They waited. It didn't happen. And they saw no misfortune came to him. Look what they did. They changed their mind and said he was a God. What in the world? How many of you know these people? Like one minute, they hate your guts. The next minute, you're their best friend. One minute, you can't do anything right. The next minute, oh, so thankful for everything you do for me. It's amazing. These people live, they live in the ocean that's being tossed. What they say doesn't matter when you know whose you are. Because they will say. They will say. So now they think Paul's a God. So what do we do from here? Well, if you're a God, then you got to talk to the leader. Why? Because that's what we do on the island of Malta. We got to find the leader. And it says in the neighborhood. I love that it says in the neighborhood because here's Luke writing from a city boy standpoint on an island. He's like, in the neighborhood, there was a guy named Publius. Ain't no neighborhood. You just rolled up on a sandy beach of a small island that no one knows about. But there's a guy. Paul could have been miserable, gripey, complaining, mad, bitter, but he wasn't. You know why he wasn't? It's because he knew whose he was and because he knew whose he was, he made a choice to focus on the mission over the misery. To focus on what God would have him do rather, rather than what was happening to him. You see this story, Publius is, is kind of odd. And I can almost see Paul now in the neighborhood of that place where the land's belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. And it happened, it happened. Just so you know, the yeah, right is not in your Bible. That is actually a sermon note that I forgot to take out of my scripture reference before I passed it over. But now you can see how my brain thinks. It happened. Luke, come on. Just happened to be. Just happened to be that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery. He was dying. Most of the island of Malta was in the same situation. You can look this up historically. And I don't know how it came to pass that Paul knew Publius's dad was sick. I don't know if in the three day time window, they're there, it said he was hospitable to them for three days. I don't know if he was eating on the porch with Publius and they were talking. And Paul noticed a, a nurse or somebody, a servant walking to him. What's going on over there? Oh, it's my dad. It's my father, he's sick. There's nothing else we can do. His fever and dysentery and we're just kind of waiting it out. Can't you see Paul? What? Yeah, my dad's sick. Oh, I got you. Yeah, so I had to, I had to do that so I could be here for this. Malta wasn't a mistake. Mal Malta wasn't an accident, was it? 
Sometimes we get so focused on preaching in Rome that we forget that God wants us to preach in Mountain Home. We get so focused on wanting to proclaim Jesus from the mountaintops that we forget that we proclaim him in the valleys too. We see Paul on his way to Rome to do this thing and God said, yeah, I'm gonna get you there, but I need you, to, I need you over here because there's gonna be an entire island that's infected by the gospel of Jesus Christ and they don't even know it yet, Paul. They don't, they don't even know. They don't even know. So Paul says, can I see him? Can I see your father? And he goes to his father and he prays over him and he lays his hands on him and he heals him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and they were cured. When you choose, what do you want me to do, God, over why in the world am I here, God? He will provide you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to show you that he is God in your life. He is still God in your life. But the, uh, but the easy question, Pastor Vince, is why? God, why is this happening? Why is, I don't know why you're in Malta. I don't know why I had to go to Malta. Sometimes I look back and I still wonder until that moment when someone comes in and says, Pastor Vince, I'm struggling with this. And I go, I have been right where you are. I washed up on the same beach. Let me tell you what God did in my life. Let me tell you what God did in my life. Let me tell you the steps I had to take to get out of it. Let me tell you how I walked out of depression. Let me tell you how I walked out of anxiety. Let me tell you how I trusted a God who in the midst of a season that I thought was a mistake made it a miracle in my life so that I could share it with you. Let me tell you about this God. And Paul said, "Let me. where's your dad? They prayed over him. His dad gets healed. The island comes to him. The island gets healed. Now revivals broke loose on this little island that nobody knows about, full of barbarians. And criticizing judgmental people. I mean, that's all we got about him so far, right? They're just waiting on him to die. He had to be a murderer. Wishy-washy back and forth. In your life, I don't know. I don't know why God has you where he has you or why you've walked through what you've walked through. What I know is that if you'll see the opportunity in the season, he has a way of changing it. This God in whom I belong to and whom I worship, he made a promise. He said, I'm going to Rome. So this snake, nah, it ain't bothering me. The shipwreck, grab a board boys, we're gonna make it. I'm gonna shake it off, I'm gonna go, I'm good. Let's go, why? Because the God who I belong to, the God whose I am, he said I would. And if he said it, I believe it. Listen, this is what happens. Watch what they, watch what, watch what happens to they in verse 10. And they also honored us greatly. And when we were about to set sail, they put on board whatever we needed those that were criticizing came around. Why? Because you stayed the course in the storm. You didn't forget whose you were. You didn't forget what he's capable of in your life. You didn't forget that he is the God that parts the seas and counts the stars. You didn't forget that he is the God that raises the dead and heals the sick. You didn't forget that he's the God that mends marriages and heals the lame. You didn't forget that he's the God that can take the barren and make it whole. You didn't forget that he's the God who is still the same God that he always has been. I don't know. I'll say it this way. Your season right now, it might not be where you thought you'd be. It's Malta. It's Malta. It might not be where you thought you'd be. Maybe it's people. It, it might not be who you thought it was supposed to be. Paul didn't know he was going to meet Publius's dad on a sick bed on an island he didn't plan to go to. But you see, there was a mission that God had laid out. And Paul chose the mission over the misery. You may be in a situation where it's what? This isn't what I had planned. Tell that to the guy on the shipwreck. He didn't have that planned. He didn't have the snake bite planned, but he had a God who made a promise. Church, 
you have a God that has made a promise. The only decision today that you have to make is do you believe him? Do you believe him? Do you believe in the God of the promise? That he'd never leave you nor forsake you, that he's got you, that all things, even your Malta right now, even your Malta, even these people, even the words, even all of it, the misery, all of it, he promised that I can work all things to the good for those that love me and are called according to my purpose. I can take them all, I can take it all and work it to the good. Do you believe that? Bow with me, church. I didn't do this in the last service, but I'm feeling compelled, so I'm just gonna do it. Christians, believers in the house, me and you're gonna talk for a minute. Have you been on Malta for a while? And you're starting to wonder if there really is a plan. Have you been on Malta for a while and you're starting to wonder if God even remembers where he put you? That you're sitting there, that you're there. Do you, do, do you, do you, are you starting to doubt? Are you starting to wonder if God hears you anymore? Christians, you can be honest about this. We've all been in a Malta. We've all had those shipwrecked places. But what I want to challenge you today to do is to trust again in the promises of God. Trust that his strength is made perfect in your weakness. Trust that he won't leave you nor forsake you. Trust that he has a plan and a purpose for you and it is a good one, says the Lord. Trust that this same God who walked out of hell itself will walk you out of the same place. Christians, if that's you this morning, can I pray for you? If that's you this morning, would you just lift your hand and put it right back down and say, Pastor Vince, I just feel like I'm in Malta. I just, I'm stuck here. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to act. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to trust. I'm just kind of stuck right here. If that's you, Christians, come on. Come on, I see you. You're not alone. Hands everywhere. I'm just kind of stuck here. Father, bless these people as they raise their hand. Bless those that didn't raise their hand because they are so stuck, they don't think anything will help. They've heard the voices waiting for them to die. They've heard the voices waiting for them to fail. And they've just started to believe it. God, if it be your will, I pray that you'd renew a right spirit in them, God, that you would swell up within their heart and in their mind that there is a God who is greater than it all. Lord, this is the God whom I belong to, the God whom I worship. And so, Father, we'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Listen, still heads bowed and eyes closed. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, you say, Pastor Vince, my whole world feels like a shipwreck. I don't know what you're talking about, seasons. And why would I have faith? Everything falls apart. There was a Jesus who came and he lived a perfect life for you. And he died, and I'm sure you've heard that story before. But I don't know that you realize that the death was on your behalf. The sin debt that he carried was yours. It was your moments of sin. It was your moments of transgression. It was your moments of being unfaithful. It was your moments of lying. It was your moments of all of the stuff. It was your moments. And that Jesus died for those things. The Bible says in that while you were yet a sinner, Jesus died for you. Why? Why would he do that? So that you would have the opportunity to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Without his sacrifice, you don't have an option. With it, it opens the door. So if you're here this morning, would you be honest with me and say, Pastor Vince, I don't know Jesus like that. Would you just lift your hand and put it right back down and say, I don't know Jesus like that. Yeah, I see you. Come on. 
Come on, don't be afraid. I'm not gonna come at you. I'm not gonna come get you. I'm not gonna tap you on the shoulder. I just, I just, I don't know Jesus like that, Pastor Vince. You can. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart. Well, I believe, Pastor Vince, what am I supposed to confess? That Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that Jesus Christ died for your sins, and that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. You confess that you're a sinner who needs a Savior. And just like we sang a little while ago, that Savior's name is Jesus. And if you'll confess that, and you believe it in your heart, the Bible says it's that simple. You shall be saved. You prayed that this morning. If you believe that in your heart this morning, then I'm so proud of you. I'm so thankful. But I also know it's a little scary and I don't want you to walk alone. So the next part is you can tell somebody Come find me. Come find one of the worship team, one of the staff. Come find somebody that you've seen here on a regular basis. Stop them and tell them. Tell somebody, today, today I said yes to Jesus, and he saved my soul. Christians, fasten on to the promises of God, for they are the only thing that will get you through. Father, I love you. And Jesus, I thank you for your grace and for your mercy and for your love. I thank you, God for the opportunity to preach today, for the honor it is to be called into the ministry. And God, I pray that anybody here that's wrestling with that, that may be seeking to be called, or God, maybe they feel like you're just nudging them in that direction. They don't know what to do with it. God, I pray you'd make us, give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear, and give us tools and resources to walk them through that so that the gospel gets pro proclaimed. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.